today designing modern board games based on George Philly's forthcoming book, A Class in Board Game Design. Lecture 3, What Makes a Good Game? I'm Professor Phillies, and today as part lab, we're going to have people playing Carcassonne, and I'm going to give some remarks on a few issues, more on game representations, something on about what makes a good game, and some discussion of components. Well, you could do whole lectures, whole courses on components. Uh, there, if you are doing commercial art, there are whole co courses on all sorts of things related to parts, and they're very substantial and important. We're going to get part of one lecture in. Uh, first of all, with respect to the Carcassonne Lab, you'll be going through three rounds of it. First, you'll play, oh, two or three rounds of everyone playing, saying what rule you're using and how you're applying the rule so that you think you're all playing the same game. Then you'll play the game under the orthodox rules as you find them in the rule book. Finally, you'll try the test panel, the alternative version of the game, where instead of draw and place card, it will be draw card tile and take note of the fact that you have a hand with one or two other tiles in it which the other people in the group may or may not see. You'll have to settle how, which rules you're playtesting on that. And when you're done with this, the lab report will be to compare the game experience of the original rules and the rules where you play Carcassonne with a hand. Are we all, question? <coughs> uh, the lab report is due Monday. Uh, the, question I the question you're answering is to compare the play experience of the normal rules and the variant rules and see what you observed about play experience. The, we're, what we're trying to do with this is to develop your understanding of how you do play testing and what play testing is. I suppose the final message on playtesting is, remember, the objective in playtesting is not to win. The objective in playtesting is to break the rules. Not cheating break the rules, but find points where the rules don't work right. Because the point of the playtest is to feed information back to the designer. This rule doesn't make sense. It's impossible to set the game up if you try to follow those instructions. The game couldn't be more dull if the intermediate part was watching grass grow an inch. You, you get the idea. So you're trying to give feedback to the game designer, and so your target effort of each of you is to write up what you learn about the game, comparing and giving feedback. And so to speak, learning by doing. All right. Other questions? Oh, I didn't say when it was due. Monday. Other questions? Me? Yes. Okay. I don't remember what it was, but I think there may have been something on the syllabus that said it was due on Friday. Not two months on the syllabus. Um, if it's due on Friday, it's not due on Friday. It's due on Monday. Okay. Um, so we, for this class, we have a design notebook. Can we like take our notes from our lecture and put those in our design notebook? Yes, you may take notes in your design notebook. Um, also on the syllabus, it talks about uh, for the final design project, um, it says that we need to come up with a theme um, for a game and historical research. And at one point in the syllabus, it says that that is due on Friday. And another point, it says that that's due on Monday. Okay. Monday. Okay. Other questions? Okay. To continue our discussion of representations, it was suggested to me that there is one other type of representation you might have, and it sort of lapses over into what you might call dexterity games. And these are really not strategic games at all, but they're sort of an edge 
beyond the pale, beyond, and when you go beyond the pale, you encounter these things. A traditional dexterity game are tiddlywinks, which are played with an English coin in the authentic version, a coin that is no longer made. Uh, instead, what you use are little plastic chips, and you somehow squeeze on the chip. I was never able to figure out how you did this. And the chip you're squeezing on pops into the air and lands near a target. And this is a pure game of dexterity. There's a tiny bit of um, skill involved. You could imagine doing this where you just try for range as opposed to hitting a target. It's a physical, purely physical skill game. Now, you can change the details of the representation. Uh, for example, there is a fine, I believe it's a Scottish sport known as caber tossing. And caber tossing is sort of like tiddlywinks, except instead of using the, one of the little plastic chip, you use a small telephone pole. And you sort of hold the telephone pole like this and walk forward and send it going and see how far you can send the telephone pole. And this is, in essence, a game of physical skill. There's no player interaction in the usual sense. It's like cross country or long jump. Uh, but it's sort of an edge beyond which we encounter something that is not a strategic game. I, I bring that up because I did mention traditional arena sports as strategic games, many of them. They're strategic for the players. For the people sitting in the audience, uh, they're the audience. It's for them, it's not a game in the same sense. Uh, for example, if I were to tell you that in Sport X, everything had been scripted out in advance, and it was known in advance to the players and the referees who was going to win and by how many points, as far as the people in the audience were concerned, if they didn't know about this little back room arrangement, the game would be exactly the same now, wouldn't it? But it would then be completely non-competitive. Uh, the gamblers would get upset no end. Let me, however, since I talked about Conquer the Internet, let me suggest a different game. And we'll see how deep, deep or shallow or challenging this one is. And the deep or shallow g game might be called nine. So we imagine the nine integers. And you and your opponent take turns calling out integers from one to nine. Well, obviously, the game doesn't go on very long. So in some sense, it's going to stop quickly. And the objective is the first person to have called out a total of three integers. It doesn't have to be first, second, third. It could be first, third, or fifth if you're the first player. And the three integers have to add to 15. Do we follow what the game objective is? So let's think about this for a second. And there are lots of combinations of orders, to be precise. There are nine factorial choices of order in which you call out the integers. Nine factorial <coughs> is a pretty healthy number. How deep or shallow or drawish does this game sound to be? If I set you and someone else playing it, what are your chances of winning going to be? Opinions. Let's start with the hands if you think the game is inclined to a draw. Hands if you think the game is winnable. Hands if you aren't sure. Hands if you recognize the game. What is it? Got it. It's tic-tac-toe. Do we recognize it as tic-tac-toe? Sure we do. This is an object called a magic square. The numbers horizontally, vertically, and diagonally crisscross all add to 15. And it, that, in fact, it includes all of the combinations of three numbers that add to 15. If you want to get to 15, you have to call off three of the numbers in a row, a column, or a diagonal. Now I ask you, is tic-tac-toe a winnable game with competent opponents, or is it a draw? It's a draw, right? 
However, I disguised it a bit, and there were only about two of you. Someone else had his hand up. You saw it was tic-tac-toe, too? Okay, there were two of you who realized what you were looking at. What I did, what I did is called re-theming. I took a game, and I changed things around a piece, and now it looks very different. Retheming is a very powerful tool in game design. I mean, you, some of you may have, how many of you played Stratego hands? Okay, a whole pile of you have played Stratego. And when I was younger than you are, it was out there and you could buy it and play it. And then at some point, someone at the company had the bright idea of changing the names of all of the pieces and maybe changing the appearance of the map a little bit and calling it a new game and people would buy it because it was really neat. Well, it was the same game it was before. It was very clever. You can do something more sophisticated than just change the names on the pieces and if you test it carefully, it will even work. Okay, let's get back to representation. Since I mentioned dexterity games and I mentioned Vast numbers of people have played this, but not under the description I just gave. Um, so having mentioned those things, <coughs> I suppose the next question is, what is what, how does a representation relate to a style or a mechanic or whatever? That is, what is a representation that makes it significant in terms of being a feature of how a game is played? Well. The short answer is the representation is what you see if you stand off in the middle distance and watch the players. And if you see them shoving toy soldiers around on a map, uh, it's probably a miniatures game. It could be a board game. There are board games with plastic soldiers. If you see people pointing at charts and rolling strange dice and looking at many more charts <coughs> and maybe even talking to each other, it could be a role-playing game. Um, if you see people out on a field doing odd things that involve mayhem, it's probably a live action replay. I didn't say what the mayhem is, swords, lacrosse sticks, body armor, whatever. Um, but in essence, a representation is what you see. Now, you can separate a game from its representation. Once upon a time, around the time most of you were born, there was a much more popular game, it seems to have faded a bit since then, called paintball. And the notion was that you donned quite old clothing, heavy, and head protection because you're shooting material objects at each other. And you go out and you play soldier on some open field or woods and you actually have a method of tracking whether you've connived to shoot your opponent. Namely, it's a sort of a BB gun, an air rifle, and if you get paint damage, you've been wounded because these, the things you're shooting are colored. This is why you wear very old clothing. You also wear heavy clothing because things are traveling fairly fast. Well, that's nice. However, one fine day, someone who was not fond of gallivanting around in the woods in, in cold weather created paint check. And paint check is a board game. It's a board war game with war game rules. It's a board game that attempts to simulate paintball. And other people have written games, they're a little different, which attempt to sim simulate and actually do simulate World Wrestling Federation television channel, or at least the wrestling part of it. So you have changed the sim you've changed the representation completely, but in a certain sense, it's the same game. It's not the completely same game in the sense that most of you would not entirely be happy if someone who um, weighed 300 pounds and can readily bench press any of us were to pick you up and bounce you off the canvas, especially since you do, most of you do not know how to roll and fall correctly, but. It's the same game in a sense. We have changed the representation and thus changed who wishes to play it. Okay, so that's representation. Now I'm going to shove ahead to a question, the question you should be thinking about 
when you are play tested. There are actually several questions. And as I said earlier, the objective in a play test session is not to win. Exception. If you can prove the player who moves third always wins, you should do so often enough that everyone agrees with you because the designer would like to hear this extremely bad news. He really would. She really would. The objective might be said to break, abuse, whatever you want to say, the rules. The point is not to cheat and ignore a rule to connive to get a win because you're not trying to win. The objective is to take the rules as written and use them in strange ways. There is a traditional cartoon due to Steve Jackson, and it's a rocket ship passenger airliner. And it's a playtest session for a tactical game on spaceships. And the captain of the ship is saying, what do you mean you stopped the hijacker by throwing atomic hand grenades at him? Well, the atomic hand grenades are in the rule. For ground combat against tanks, they're in the rules. I use them. This is known as breaking, not cheating, breaking the rules, doing something the designer did not contemplate and yes, you did manage to stop the hijacker, among other things. Uh, it turns out there is a historical example of an airline hijacking that was stopped this way, but it was low power hand grenades and Boeing 747s, not in America, as it happens, are very heavily built. But it worked. Okay, so what is the point of playtesting? The point of playtesting is to answer the question, is it a good game? <clears throat> Basic question. And, and, and maybe we say in early stages of playtesting, what needs fixing? What is wrong with the game? Well, in order to settle what needs fixing, what is wrong with the game, to a certain extent you have to have some notion of what makes a good game, what makes a bad game. And so we should start there. And so we will start with the simplest issue, the rules. And the rules have to be complete. I mean, if you chug through the rules and you play the game, and at some point you realize there's no reference to victory conditions, there is no way for the game to end. It just goes on forever like a television soap opera. There's a problem. Very dangerous word here, unambiguous. It is assuredly the case that if you are in a group of people who play games a lot, there will be the rules lawyer who will find re astonishing interpretations of simple English language rules. Except when she's playing on the other side, when she finds the opposite interpretation of the same rule. And, so, and you can always say, well, you can try to make things unambiguous, you know, like the preliminary course handout, which is still being edited, that I sent out. However, the more words you put in to make things unambiguous, the more creative interpretations there are of what the rules do or do not mean. If you have a large group that plays the game a lot, there eventually come to pass um, understandings as to what the rules are in general agreement. but you want rules that don't 
have two clearly contradictory meanings, like my statement in the preliminary handout, which I sent out early, which were confused as to whether something was due on Friday or Monday. We don't have class on Friday, of course, but well. In any event, the rules need to be complete, unambiguous. I shall also put in the word clear. And that mm, covers a lot of ground. Um, how many of you know how to play Go hands? OK. Those of you who are familiar with the game, even those of you who don't know the rules, may have heard the assertion that it's a game with an extremely short set of rules. There's a rule on where you, where you play the stones. There is a rule on how you do capture. Um, there is a rule on how you score, which is not the same in every country, as far as I can make out. Uh, there is a rule on eliminating the chess equivalent of perpetual check, where um, <clears throat> I take, you take, I take, you take, and this goes on forever and there is no alteration. Uh, that rule leads eventually to a, you get perpetual check by running in a circle. Uh, this is viewed as extremely bad luck for a histor amusing historical reason. Um, but the usual statement is the rules are very short. On the other hand, the game scoring at the end of the game may have the rule, this is the Japanese rules, that in order to decide whether a particular formation is alive or dead, you don't, if you disagree, play it out. You consult the book. And suddenly the rules become extremely large and detailed because of the way the scoring is carried out. Um, nonetheless, the rules are fairly clear. However, apparently there is a sport in some of the countries where this game is played a lot where you try to write the rules in as short a manner as possible, leaving as many of the details of the rules as possible to inference rather than saying explicitly what happens. And at some point, and it eventually becomes an exercise of cleverness in realizing that the extra conjunction here is actually the capture rule, even though there's no mention of capture anywhere. Um, now, those are rules that are very concise, but not necessarily very clear. Okay, so what else makes a good game? I suppose the first issue you encounter is shape. Different people want different things in a game, just as they want different things in a novel. And the people who want a modern romance novel with steam rising off the pages, a modern military combat novel, uh, Georgette Higher Regency revival, a serious literary novel, Shakespeare, or if you're up to handling the language, Beowulf or Chaucer, um, different tastes, and what one person likes, other people will not. So you have, and shape essentially describes what the game tries to do and will tend to sort out different people who want different things. Of course, we can find games that have no tactics at all. Handyland comes immediately to mind. Or Everest, which is probably a few of you have seen. And when you were about yay tall, you probably thought these were fancy, fa absolutely fantastic. On the other hand, when you got very slightly older, if your parents came from the right background, there was a magician named Murphy, and the Murphy board game, which appears to be a race game like Candyland, except you have spells and monsters, and it's Dungeons and Dragons for five years old, and there is actually strategy in it. It's a brilliant innovation for luring people in. It's like giving little children magic cards, except the game only has five different cards in it. Isn't that a clever idea? And it's free. Okay, having said that, what sort of things do we expect in a strategy game? Well. I suppose the simplest answer is strategy. 
There have to be choices, and the choices have to matter. <coughs> if you are in one of these text adventure games, and no matter which track you follow and which decision you made, after eight steps, you turn to page 75, and page 75 reads, Instant death! No saving throw! Well, there really isn't any strategy there, because no matter what you do, other than refusing to enter the dungeon, you're dead. And so the strategy is meaningless. Strategy choices have to matter. There is also the notion of richness, The notion of richness is that at any point in the game, you have multiple choices as to if you choose A, go to page 7. If you choose B, go to page 17. Richness means you have a fair number of different alternatives to consider. And because you consider all, can consider them, it's more worth thinking about. Contrary to richness is known as analysis paralysis. I shall give you a real game rule. You have ten cards. They correspond to ten actions. On each turn, you choose any three of your cards and play them in the order you chose them, right? You follow what the rule is. That means on each turn you have 10 times 9 times 8 or 720 different possible moves. Uh, in contrast, in chess, even if you count the extremely stupid moves, you typically have more like 40. Suddenly, your analysis in Go, um, even on the first turn, you have only 361 possible choices, and that's reduced by symmetry. Um, so the answer is that um, at some point you have so many different choices that if you have a, an opponent who insists on analyzing in detail every single one of them each turn in complete detail, and then maybe changing her mind or his mind once or twice before everything is finished, the game will proceed very slowly. That's analysis paralysis. Um, a good game may give you a lot of choices, but if you have a strategy, you can prune the decision tree down to the point where you could do something intelligent very, fairly quickly. Um, buried in analysis paralysis is dead time. Now, dead time is a shape issue at, because different people have different tolerances for dead time. If we are playing um, Fire in the East, the <coughs> German invasion of Russia, World War II, or When the Leaves Fall, German invasion of France, or French invasion of Germany, they were both trying it at the same time, 1914, you realize that the other person has like a thousand unit counters to move, and even if they are proceeding in a brisk and sensible manner, there will be plenty of time to go out to the restaurant, order the takeout, and come back, and the other person will still be moving. Well, that's one end of dead time. The other end of dead time is scissor, papers, rocks, where, gee, it's almost instantaneous. Different people are, have different dead time tolerances, but you want to know what the dead time is. Okay. Piece of dead time, which I sort of mentioned, could be called graining. And graining is a representation of the amount of detail I show relative to the theme. For example, we will have a basic game of warfare Side number one, side number two. You then roll a d6. On a one, three, or five, side one wins. On a two, four, or six, side two wins. The game resolves to one die roll. Gee, that's a very, it may be historically accurate. Both sides had about an even chance of winning. 
Um, but there's not much detail here. What you can do with graining, though, is to break the game down into more and more detail and more and more pieces. And as you have more and more detail and more and more pieces, there, there's more, there are more things to consider. There are more possible actions. For example, if I have a car racing game, we'll come back to this in a later lecture. Here is a representation of the race. And there are six positions. And you draw cards. And the cards let you move your car back and forth relative to its neighbors up and down the track. And if you play your cards right, you will be in position number one when the uh, game ends. On the other hand, we have another game of car racing where the velocity and the acceleration are tracked. And the velocity is changed in each turn by It's a physics equation. Most of you should remember that from high school physics. Oh dear, I've given a few of you nightmares, haven't I? But most of you should recognize that. And that is the, but how do you control A, the acceleration? Brakes, slip streaming, gas pedal settings. There are a whole bunch of things you can do to vary A. And the game tracks them. And by the way, you cannot simply go from zero power to pedal down engine at full power instantaneously. It takes several turns. You notice this is somewhat more detailed and graining. It's somewhat closer to what you would expect in a computer simulation. Well, that's coarse graining. And different people want different amounts of it. And so you have to ask what the resolution is. Um, Stuck in here someplace, dead time analysis paralysis is sort of the number of decisions, or maybe I should say, instead of number of decisions, the number of choices you have to make on any single turn. Um, the more, if there are very few decisions to make, the game may be very fast, unless the decisions are extremely profound and hard to analyze. But it may not be extremely interesting. Uh, on the other hand, if it's sort of we are in the dungeon and we have reached a corridor and we keep reaching corridors and our only choice is left or right. And we have no information until we've chosen left or right. And then we have something violent and unpleasant, hopefully, to the monster happening. Uh, that's a game with very few decisions. On the other hand, if you are playing a really large, complicated game, you have lots of decisions, and that's a scale. Oh, let's see. Player interaction. We will by and by reach Glenn Blacko's taxonomy. It was incomplete of why people play role-playing games. But one of the notions, if you are playing a game like Dungeons and Dragons, and you are not playing it as it was described in the original three books of Gygax and Arneson, uh, the players get to discuss things. And a substantial part of the game, the interesting part of the game, is not the combat. It is the social interactions between the players, characters, the social interactions between the players, uh, the interactions with the non-player characters and the games master. And the net result is player interaction can be quite substantial. Um, if you look at Carcassonne, you draw a tile. You discuss who is going to play the tile where. And you give people rationales for playing the tile where it will give you points. And to some extent, you can promise, but not a very large extent, you can promise to reward people for what they're doing. The variant game, where you have a displayed hand so people can see what you have, you can now say, if you play there, I promise to play here. And now there's interaction with rewards and benefits. Um, the other end of this, it's a weakness of the game, Puerto Rico, there's not a lot of player interaction in the sense that you might want someone to do something, 
but the ability to interact, player to player to interact, or maybe we should say player character to player character to interact, the ability to reward someone for doing what you want is somewhat restricted. And the ability to interact with each other is somewhat limited. That's a design decision. Remember, this was a very successful, well-liked game, but there are ranges of negotiation. The other end from um, Puerto Rico, I suppose, is diplomacy. The traditional diplomacy game, yeah, there are armies and fleets moving around, and if you were a large power, you might have seven of them. Uh, and they're all evenly balanced against their opponents, so your cha ability to win militarily is extremely weak. Uh, the game is almost entirely a game of social interactions. So player interaction, that's something you could like. Uh, let's turn this around. Let us consider the sorts of things we could have in a game that might be viewed as negative. We talked about features, and different people want different things. But let us consider some features that often aren't viewed well. Solution. Suppose I am playing tic-tac-toe. There is a guaranteed strategy which ensures that no matter what the other guy does, I will either have a draw or a win. Or it might be we are playing some number of games where for one side or the other there is a forced victory. This is a chess board. Circled pieces are white. The isolated king here is black. White to move. Guaranteed outcome if you know the rules. Queen moves here. Black has no response and has lost. Forced victory. Now there can be there is a whole collection of puzzles, and there are people who spend their time developing puzzles um, with on which you have to work very hard to solve on the magic move that gives you, say, white to move in six. <coughs> there is an even more amusing set of these where it's white to win using the 1892 rules. You might say, what, why do we care about the 1892 rules? And the answer is, the way white wins is to move the white pawn to the eighth rank and promote it into a black knight. It may occur to you that under normal rules you cannot promote your piece into a piece of the other side, let alone a specific piece. However, under the 1892 rules, which had a certain omission in phrasing, you could, and because you have promoted it to a black knight, the black king, which is next to it, cannot escape check in a few turns by capturing it, which the black king could do if it were a white piece. <coughs> uh, so solution, I mean, finding solutions can be fun, but games that have solutions are bad. Slippery slope. The issue with slippery slope is that we are playing the game, oh, let us suppose it is a 4x space warfare game. And because we are playing a 4x space warfare game, which some of you may find almost as interesting as knitting or sleeping or watching grass grow, uh, one side or the other gets an economic advantage and a production advantage and a research advantage and applies this to continue to build up their advantage. And at first the advantage is small and in a while the advantage is larger and, it, and after a certain number of turns, every turn they are building more warships than all of their opponents have warships on the board. And after not very long, if people know the rules and understand what's going on, they realize they are 
headed down a slope of increasing steepness. And at some point, we are going to go off the edge of the cliff. But it is going to take a while to get there. It's just that we're on the slippery slope, and we can escape. And now the game is very dull. If you are playing chess, and it is a normal chess game, and you connive to lose your queen, both of your rooks, and the bishop, in four consecutive turns, you may suspect you are in a bad shape. Uh, there is, of course, the famous game of Morphy, in which he did those as a sacrifice. I think it was only one of the two rooks as a sacrifice. And after he'd done this, the other he had checkmate. It's just that he did had to do certain things and threw away most of his major pieces, and at the end he had won. Playing that out, if you're, you have that opportunity, requires extreme certainty that you have not screwed things up. Because if you have, you're down a queen, two rooks, and a bishop, and you have nothing, to, no compensation. Uh, in chess, though, if you manage to go down a major piece, especially queen or rook, and there's no compensation of any sort, the usual wise move is called resignation. And it's well understood and is viewed as good manners. OK. Dull and repetitive There are bunches of computer games where you have layers of economics. So first we plant the trees. Well, we planted them 30 turns earlier. Now we harvest the trees. Now we feed them to the lumber mills. Now we send them to the shipyards. And there are a whole bunch of steps like this, like 10 or 20 of them. And eventually, we're, we're sending clipper ships out to do trade and get points. And if you are playing a computer game, there will be setups where you designate automatically, the forest sends the trees to this lumber mill. I don't have to enter that command every turn. The magic phrase sometimes is waypoints. You tell things to happen automatically, and the computer is happy to do this for you. The computer may even think it's interesting. But if you are playing a game yourself, and you have to do all these steps by hand, it gets extremely repetitive. The error rate starts to become significant. It becomes dull, dull, dull. That's a bad feature. Um, Board games with computer support would solve this, but I can't actually name any orthodox board games that have computer support to handle some of these background things. That might be an interesting MQP for someone to develop. OK, what else can go wrong with a game? Many people will complain about Kingmaker. Not Kingmaker, the old Avalon Hill title. <clears throat> Kingmaker the rule. I am in an unfortunate position. Due to my usual brilliant tactics, I am in a three-player game and am clearly finishing third. And the math shows it is absolutely impossible for me to catch up with number one or number two. <clears throat> However, because of where I am, I have the amusing choice that I can throw my support to either side, and I determine who wins. The skill of the two sides doesn't matter. <coughs> I will be large enough that by throwing my support to you folks or to you folks, I determine who wins the game as opposed to your skill. This is called Kingmaker, and it is widely viewed as a bad design feature. OK. Um, what else might make a good or a bad game? We will talk about theming in the future. I have mentioned regularly the pirate game. <coughs> and so you have ships, and you have people on the ships, and you have capture, and you have towns you can visit, and storms, and giant octopi, and all these other interesting standard nautical hazards. Um, so we are playing a pirate game. And if we have arranged the rules right, the fact that it is a pirate game helps you remember what the rules are and why they work the way they are. 
So if we have a pirate game and the rule is, here is the ship I have found, and the rule is I maneuver my ship next door and send my people across with sharp things to reason with the people on the other ship. Uh, we can label the counters and rule them in all sorts of different ways, but if it looks like you have to come next door, you have to board, and there's some military unpleasantness, even, even if it's the rules run rather oddly, if the rules sort of look like the theme, it works, and people can remember it. Uh, the opposite of theming is typical trick-taking games. How many of you have played bridge or poker or something like that, hands? So you recognize what I'm talking about. Most of you know what I mean by a trick-taking game. Whist. <clears throat> trick-taking games are extremely hard to theme. The problem is there are not a lot of natural pro events you can describe where you keep recycling the same sort of process <clears throat> and you put down your claims and in the end someone wins. A trick-taking game could be viewed as a very strange sort of auction. Um, <clears throat> you could say bridge is an auction. You're trying to purchase the hand. But there are real rules on what your allowed bids are. And you have to choose if you will bid make a high bid and hope to take the auction, or if you realize, um, yeah, I can play the ace. Unfortunately, the next hand over clearly has no more cards of this color and does have something of the trump suit, and I will surely lose the ace to no avail. <clears throat> you, you sort of recognize what I'm talking about. And the net result is, in trick-taking games, well, it's a strategy, but where do you see a natural process of life that looks vaguely like trick-taking? The result is it is fairly difficult to produce a trick-taking game that has a solid theme. Uh, one game that makes a reasonable effort, if memory serves, is Ivanhoe, because being parked at a um, tournament and you dress up in large amounts of steel plate on the back of a horse, and you ride at someone else, and the steel plate is designed to keep you from getting killed, or, or, and possibly even to keep you from breaking large numbers of things when you fall off the rear of the horse at high speed. It's better than the front. The horse will trample you. Um, <clears throat> well, the net result is it's hard to do trick-taking games with a theme, but theming is good if the rules matter. If, on the other hand, you have, gee, we're going to have this collection of very clever mechanisms. And they're all clever mechanisms, and they're all ingenious, and they're all good. And they don't line up well with each other, and there's no, they don't line up well with the theme. It's hard to remember the rules. It's not a good game. So I have discussed playtesting. And as I have run us almost out of time, we shall postpone parts to a future discussion. However, for the moment, we have exhausted time on this lecture. Are there questions at this point? If there are no questions at this point, we are out of time. Class is dismissed.